I'm taking a little bit of a different approach probably to what you guys are going to see today and my background um, in ad tech and business development and partnerships is probably going to come through a lot here. Um, I'm sort of new to the space. I would say I'm about a year and a half in. Um, and what I found really helpful over the last sort of year and a half for myself was to sort of, sort of take a step back and contextualize what it is that we're trying to do um, with Web3 and data and reimagining things and where we're at today and what we're even talking about when we say we want to get to this like mass scale of adoption for Web3 and what's going to get us there. So I know we're building all this cool tech. There's really cool ways to do things. Um, but ultimately, sort of what's the why and how are we going to get there? And so I'm sharing some personal insights um, based on my journey uh, in sort of Web2 ad tech world. Um, and then I'll get into, obviously, the Filecoin and Tableland products and how I think those weave in. Um, so just a quick pause in case anybody here is from the Game 7 ecosystem. We're doing this sort of fun scavenger hunt together with them uh, for ETHCC Paris. If you are or if you're not and you want to join the ecosystem, you can scan the QR code uh, to get some experience points, which go towards uh, sort of a fun experience in the Game 7 uh, uh, community. So with that... Um, to, taking a step back, I know we've all seen this probably being part of the ProtoClabs uh, ecosystem, but I do like to think about what um, you know, the evolution of the web has meant to how we're creating content and also um, how we're defining data and who owns that and how value is created. And so we know, you know Web 1 was read-only, Web 2 is read and write, and Web 3 is read-write known. But in Web 2, um, there was this really sort of big shift that happened over time. So the writing has changed from, you know, simply commenting, joining chat rooms, um, to social media, user-generated content, to a point today where there are so many people creating the vast majority of the content at production level quality of what we're consuming. Um, and I believe that's sort of fundamentally changing our perceptions of what we want out of the internet. And that's sort of like the, the, the leading the pathway to how we're reimagining data uh, and what it means to, to unlock um, sort of this open data economy. So looking at sort of Web 2's silo data and, and what that means, I come from an ad tech background where monetizing data meant literally just putting ads on websites. And that made sense because the people that were creating you know, print media were publishing this to the internet. Um, they were putting all their resources into giving us stuff to read. And then in order to get that for free, you had to look at an ad. Um, so that makes sense. What happened when social media started becoming a thing was People at first were obviously just kind of sharing pictures of their friends and, and random posts, <laughs> but eventually that turned into um, something a little bit more. People started creating actual content. Um, they started sharing links to the things that they were reading so that their friends could also read the same things. And I was working at Huffington Post, which I don't know if any of you know Huffington Post, but um, I was working at Huffington Post, which was owned by AOL at the time, and um, they were kind of like a lifestyle news media brand. and. It felt like overnight, 52% of the traffic of people coming to their website was being referred to by Facebook. Um, and it was re being referred by Facebook Mobile. So all good, they put all these resources into getting more people to visit their website. And then what happened was Facebook gave them a call and said, hey, by the way, um, people are no longer gonna get pushed out to the Huffington Post. The Huffington Post is gonna have to put their content on Facebook and we're gonna take a 30% cut of all the revenue that you're uh, making. Um, and also in a few months, you're gonna stop having access to all of that data as well. And so that's all gonna live within Facebook, which you know, for a media company with pretty slim margins, they were like, shit, what do we do? Um, and spoiler alert, Huffington Post in Canada shut down, I think about 12 months later, because they just, they couldn't, um, they couldn't keep up. So again, being mindful, we're a capitalist society, it kind of makes sense, right? Facebook saw this opportunity, there's all these people on their platform, that's how they're finding content. We need to make money off of that and we can make a lot of money and so that's what happened. But what happened over time was we started to see this changing tide of value creation. So it's no longer just the media publishers that are creating content that are bringing people to these platforms, it's the people themselves and the users that are doing it. And we see that sort of everywhere I see this you know, in Paris where things are much more curated, there's production level content, whether it be on TikTok, whether it be on YouTube, wherever it is that users are creating. And so these things are emerging around, you know, how do we start to share that value and social media platforms are starting to give creators tools to monetize. But 
I think this is sort of what's creating this fundamental shift in how do we create a new internet where it's indicative of how people are actually creating content and creating data and, and creating value out of that and, and what does it mean to have sort of this fair value share that's happening. Um, and then also who's sort of protecting that user privacy. And so I think this is where we're starting to sort of see this changing tide in value creation. So this is like what I believe is the so what. So as an everyday user, they might not be looking at this in the context of data, but the so what is if I'm creating a ton of value and I have a million followers coming to different places to see what I'm doing, then I want a fair share of that. And what does that fair share mean and how do we start to divvy that up? I think the other piece is people are starting to pay more attention to just privacy and transparency. You know, AI and, and LLMs is also shining a big light on this and, you know, people kind of worried about their identity and all that sort of stuff. So we're seeing more sort of controls pop up, more regulation has come, more targeted education to consumers to what data they're putting out on the internet and what that means for them. Um, and we want more security, we want more transparency, and I think that's sort of this like pr on a principle level fundamental shift that's happened. Um, and all the while, sort of in the background, you know, Web3 has been coming to fruition. And so I see this like Web3 movement as really nicely aligned to some of those shifts. And so when you think about the blockchain, you know, we know it's open, it's transparent. Um, you can prove ownership in a digital sense, which when we're creating all this digital content, I feel like that's really important. Um, crypto is creating these new ways to uh, incentivize people, reward people, and move value on the internet. Um, you know, and then of course decentralized storage, what Filecoin is doing is making it more secure and more persistent to put your files and your data um, online. And then I believe there's this really important place as well for decentralized databases to make that data more open and more interoperable and sort of, sort of create this movement of an internet where we can move value a little bit more easy and your data becomes more liquid. Um, and so I'm gonna focus on the uh, data, obviously side of this. Um, Again, on the Filecoin and FVM side, if you're here, I'm assuming you're very familiar with it. Um, but I like to contextualize, you know, like the so what of the FVM and the programmability and like what does it really mean when we're like, oh, we're bringing programmability to Filecoin. For me, it took me a while to have this aha moment, which is like we've created this baseline that is the Filecoin network that is reimagining the way that we can store files. It's making it more secure. Uh, it's making it more persistent and it's making it more open. But now we have to build all the pieces on top of that that make that really usable. And eventually those building blocks are what is going to power the ability to create really cool new user experiences that I don't know what those are. I don't think any of us like fully know what those are. We'd probably be you know, rolling in the dough right now. But I do think that creators are going to come up with these based on the tools that we're building today. And so I kind of look at Filecoin as creating this like core structure and the FVM bringing programmability to that and then databases and decentralized databases being in charge of making all of that data very usable. And so, you know, today any experience that we access on the internet is powered by a database. Um, Decentralized databases, I believe, create this you know, critical layer of making all of the data that we're bringing to this decentralized ecosystem really usable um, to create you know, fun experiences for users that we ultimately want to use. Are users going to care that it's decentralized? Probably not. But there are pieces to that decentralization that will ultimately translate to features that are interesting. And I have some examples of that in a little bit. Um, that being said, adoption for decentralized systems is still slow. And, you know, it makes sense because adoption for Web3 is still slow. And so uh, until and unless those um, user requests are really coming through, why is somebody going to go through the effort of learning the decentralized system and implementing it unless there's, you know, there's a pure use case um, that either their customers are using or they're just trying to innovate. Um, and so we're seeing that most Web3 players that we speak to are still actually operating on centralized databases. Um, centralized databases are easier to adopt. You can adopt them a little bit quicker um, and people are familiar with them. So again, I think that is, is, is just a sort of a symptom of where we're at. I'm losing it here. Maybe this will work. Oh, there we go. 
Um, and so at Tableland, we're trying to obviously create what we believe to be a um, critical sort of decentralized Web3 database. And so some features that we believe are really important in that is that it should be relational, so enabling um, more advanced experiences for users via tables, schemas, joins, et cetera. Um, being a familiar language, so Tableland is built in SQL. Um, permissionless and decentralized infrastructure, so um, enabling sort of a network of, of community to come in and actually build this thing and keep it persistent. And then creating something that's interoperable, so using Web3 native um, pieces like wallets uh, and NFT ownership to be able to dictate the access control um, and who can access and change data within the table and network. Um, and we believe that ultimately that's what's going to activate all of this awesome data that is stored on Filecoin. Um, so we're seeing the amount of data that's being stored on Filecoin increase. We're seeing the interest um, in using decentralized technologies increase. Um, and now we're just trying to figure out, okay, how do we start to create user experiences from all of that data? And we believe that Tableland is filling this gap between smart contract um, driving dApps, and then also the decentralized storage network. Um, Tableland provides this indexed, queryable um, network of tables so that dApps, you know, anywhere can actually tap into that network and query. Um, and it also provides a really nice and sort of easy way to be able to access data that's stored on Filecoin. So for large data sets that are stored, they want to index with the metadata, host that metadata on Tableland, and be able to find the CIDs for the things that they're trying to um, locate within the, the Filecoin ecosystem. So in terms of just some practical use cases, one of the big use cases we're seeing for Tableland right now are dynamic NFTs, um, dynamic sort of decentralized web experiences. Um, if you think about how metadata was sort of handled it, traditionally in Web3, it was either static sort of metadata on JSON files that were then stored in a decentralized network and then you couldn't really access or do anything with those. Um, or they were stored on chain, which is very expensive to do anything with. So Tableland kind of allows you to use the security of your host chain to write to a network of Tableland SQL tables. But then once they are on those tables, you can mutate that data um, and you can provide specific Web3 native access control to who can change that. So Kitty Car is um, a Web3 game that is building with Tableland. Um, and they would essentially enable you to only change your NFT of your cart if you own that NFT. So I have access to one row of their table, and if I earn, say, a gold cart, I can choose when I want to turn that on because I own that NFT. Um, the other sort of nice thing about this is it's all open. So Kitty Cart is on Arbitrum, um, but if somebody you know wanted to launch a game on FEM, for example, um, and they wanted to give anyone in Kitty Cart that has a gold cart access to their game in some special way, they can open uh, openly query that table because it is all open. Um, and so again, not a ton of it, not a ton of interoperability adoption at this point because I think that the users just aren't there yet. But as adoption increases and we want to connect these communities, I think that we'll see that a lot more. Um, I've already mentioned sort of activating data on Filecoin, so a way to query and index and search um, large data sets within the Filecoin ecosystem. Data DAOs are another great use case of so being able to assign access control to who can actually change the data that's located within a data DAO, so keeping it really open so anyone can query it, but only allowing people with certain permissions via wallet addresses or NFTs to actually write to that database um, and provide data within that uh, ecosystem. Uh, ZK SIG is a, a project building with us, so they're storing um, ZK proofs on Tableland, so you can query um, for verifiably uh, signed documents. Um, and then ultimately what we're really looking to do is how do we sort of bridge that gap from Web 2 to Web 3 and make it really easy and fr frictionless for people to start to adopt the principles of decentralized data and open um, ecosystems. And so. We are, this is hot off the press, um, so we're really happy to share Table and Basin, which is a new product that we're launching, which allows you to bridge any production um, database to the Table and network. Um, and you can do that in minutes. So if you look at this uh, sort of demo of the setup tool, um, all you really need is the path to your database, um, your secret key, and then the, um, the time frame of how often you would like to send snapshots back to the network. Um, 
And so what's really cool about Table and Basin is once you've connected your database, so it's a Web2 database, it doesn't actually touch the database that you're using in your Web2 application. So you can keep that running. If you're trying to like slowly dip your toes into what a decentralized database might be, you want to give your community or collaborators access to it in this decentralized way, or even just the confidence of knowing that okay, I'm a startup in Web3, I'm asking you to do all of this stuff with your data with me, I've told you all your data is stored in this decentralized persistent way, but the database that makes that all usable is centralized. So if I go to business and you don't have access to my like AWS login, how do you access all that stuff? And so having you able to actually back this up and put it into a decentralized um, ecosystem, I think, um, is a really interesting and cool way to sort of dip your toes into uh, a decentralized database infrastructure. Once um, you have the URL to the published database, uh, real-time verifiable updates are published directly to your community. So um, provides like a really nice transparency to what you're building. Incremental changes and periodic snapshots are published to Filecoin. So the changes actually happen um, like every second. So they're captured every second, but the snapshots and the compaction um, happen once a day by default. Um, you can also download, fork, and rewind your data. Um, so anybody can kind of come in and create a copy of that data. And so in a live environment, that's also cool because if someone in your community wants to take a copy of your live database that li synchronizes live and then you know create an application on top of that data or create analytics on top of that, they can do that without impacting, again, your live production database that you're running in your DAP or your app. Um, and so again, just a little demo here, just showing how you can continuously sync updates to the network. Uh, in this example, we are doing it at one minute increment just to showcase how uh, it gets passed to the Filecoin network. Um, but in reality, this would happen once every 24 hours. And then finally, uh, I mentioned this, but this is showcasing how you can actually branch a database. So you can fork it. Um, and have a backup and restore to a specific point in time of your production database. So you could actually go back in history and say, hey, hey, I want to pull a backup of this database of this date and time, fork it, and then you know, do what you will with that version of the database, whether it's yourself or somebody um, that is in your community or someone that you're collaborating with. So if this is something you guys are interested in, um, I also have a QR code at the end that you can scan that's probably a little easier, uh, but we're just releasing um, sort of the, the startup kits and we're just looking for people to sign up and um, whether you just wanna give feedback when you wanna try it out, it is free. Um, and so yeah, we would love to hear from you. Um, and then finally, just taking things one step back up um, as I promised to do. So, what does reaching mass adoption really mean? So I think you know what I just showcased was sort of this like, how do we start to get people to think about bringing their database infrastructure into this decentralized way? And then as user demand is asking for experiences that require decentralized databases, then I think we start to see that type of mass adoption. But there are some things happening today that I think are sort of indicative and nodding towards um, at least a more macro sort of adoption of, of these principles. And I think I mentioned AI, I think open language systems, the ability to collaborate on large pieces of data is gonna be absolutely paramount in order to sort of bring AI to where it needs to be and to compete with the sort of the big players in the space. So I think um, that will likely drive this sort of desire for open and sort of more liquid data. Um, I think the opportunity to simplify collaborations, there's a lot of work to be done around how you keep things private, how we make sure that you know, we're not exposing PII. Um, but I look at like the Delta and Starbucks rewards and I think about all of these like collaborative sort of projects that can work really well together without having to go through um, the headaches of trying to make different databases work together. Uh, and I think that this infrastructure can really help that. Um, and then finally, I touched on social media a lot just because I think the fact that we're creating so much of what's on the internet is really the fundamental thing that's changing how things um, are, are being created and what kind of value we're creating on the internet. Um, but I signed up for threads. I don't know how many people here signed up for threads. Can I actually just, out of curiosity, how many people signed up for threads in this room? So Web3 audience. <laughs> All right. We got two. Okay, so um, I signed up for Threads, and being a true nerd, I stopped to read the fine print. And um, they talk about how they're actually going to be part of the Fediverse. So by signing up for Threads, you're 
joining the Fediverse, which is essentially this um, community of open source tools. And so Facebook actually gives you this heads up that your content will be available in different ecosystems and apps that are also part of that, and sort of this open source um, community. And so. I think just that like nod to the thinking that we're moving in this direction where people are wanting to take their content and their data with them and even you know the bigger um, behemoths are thinking about it is an indication that there is true user desire for it um, and we're going to have to start um, figuring out how to make that possible. And so with that, I say we're really excited to, cr to create the composable data layer of the internet that I believe will power the experiences of tomorrow. Um, I'm really excited to see what those experiences are and I think here in this room we're all sort of creating the baseline of what is going to uh, enable that to uh, be dreamed up. And so um, thank you guys for joining. If you guys are interested in learning more, the first QR code is the sign up for Basin. Um, the second is a pilot program. So we have a pilot program where we incubate projects that want to try um, launching a proof of concept with Tableland. Um, and so you can apply there. Um, and then we also have a newsletter. We have some exciting product updates to come and that's the best way to sort of keep in touch. So, and then again, if you want to join the scavenger hunt. And that's it.